This is Hardcore Podcast. You just heard Kings Never Die. This track, Stand For It All. Today, the new record is out. All the rats. Uh, today, the guest tonight is Dan Nastasi of Monkey Pup, Doggy Dog, who did a lot of cool shit just playing around with Eddie Leeway. Uh, if you heard that track, I'm Your Pusher, that all had Dan to do with it. And his project that you've heard us play a couple songs from, Kings Never Die. That's the what uh, we're talking about tonight, and Kings Never Die, the record's out. You can go to kingsneverdieofficial.com, and uh, all the social medias, again, we have this linked on tihcpodcast.com, and check out Kings Never Die. Dan Nastasi brought something special to Hardcore. His story's fucking awesome, and I'm going to try to keep it brief, that way we can get right into it, but it's pretty cool to uh, have a... A bunch of people now that have been doing kick-ass bands for 20, 30 years, starting new projects, keeping shit going. Because, I mean, it, you know, there's Fool's Game and Pain of Truth and all these younger bands that just play every single show, every single weekend. But it is cool to see the old guard kicking it back up, putting tracks out. So I want to support them as well. Kings Never Die, again, once again, the track is Stand For It All. We announced lately on the internet... Earlier this week, the Kev One benefit, Kevin Sia, Kev One, Fuldos, Terra Zone, uh, longtime New York hardcore, infamous, and now uh, his name is beyond etched in legend, as he passed from us at the, or I think the early September, or late August last year. Uh, Zach gave us a call. We were talking about Keystone Jam and FYA. Said, yo, man, Kevin passed away. And that was a hard thing to swallow. 
And FYA came, um, and the show sold out. The Keystone Jam went on sale, so Keystone had been like the first bulldoze show. And there was a good warm up for them, and it was fucking crazy. But there was something special about FYA. And then carrying on, they've played a bunch of shows. Obviously, the Black and Blue Bowl, the show that Greg did with and announced and put on sale within five days at uh, Kenilworth VFW. And now we can announce this show. That way there's no other conflicts with the bulldoze stuff. It is Saturday, June 24th, 4 p.m. Bulldoze, Shattered Realm, Freight Train. This is our first show back in over 20 years. And then if you want to count the Harry Cat show where myself and Damien from Punishment played, then they haven't played a show in 21 years. Um, All Shall Suffer. I know that I was writing real quick to put the flyer out, but... All South Shuffer, that's uh, Denied. That's an old school New York hardcore band. Kept one, had a lot of love for them. Put the record on the time serve records. We're going to put them on. And a bunch of the hard bands that are making fucking the kind of hardcore that Bulldoze happened in today. Like Bayway, One by One, Shot Out. Might add a couple more, but uh, tomorrow the link will be live for tickets for that. And if you want to and uh, support but have it yet, there's also been a GoFundMe up for Kevin's family. He had a wife and daughters and, you know, give him some love. So the best way hardcore people can do love is have a benefit show. Um, oh, real quick. This is coming up pretty soon. We had a show with Sansu Gabag and Jarhead Fertilizer and Stabbed. Now we're adding a whooping ass complete Balls of the wall, fucking hard, but fucking blistering fast death metal band, Weeping from New Jersey. I'm going to put a link up just for you guys to check them out. That's from fucking real deal, raw fucking death metal shit. Adding them to the bill. Um, but I'll go in order as once they were adding them to the bill if you see the flyer get updated. So, this Saturday, media, PA, we have Fool's Game, Pain Clinic, Deal with God, Fire in the Blood, and crashing down. This is a soupy project. Soupy butt. Love Ben Soupy. He's killing it with Fool's Game. Does a lot of shows in bongs and media. They, you know, nice young Turk coming up in Philadelphia hardcore. And yeah, so cool, cool thing to do Saturday Memorial Day. Then maybe we'll all go to Nifty, Nifty 50s after. Should be fucking fun. Um, June twenty, uh, June second isn't just Sansuga Bog, but it's this fucking killer fucking show that Bob Wilson has at the Philadelphia Mocha which is Brain Tourniquet Killing Pace, Sinister Feeling um those bands are just ass ripping fucking not the uh the downbeat goon bands but some fucking real fucking ill shit check it out, uh, everything we have is at phillyhcshows.com and there's so much, I, I'm not even gonna run it all through, I will tell you that we are coming up on the Drain Show it's at the church, June 9th, completely sold out. We still have tickets available, but not for long for the Incendiary Show, which is June 23rd at Underground Arts. Thank you for everybody who came to the No Pressure Show at Underground Arts. I love when bands say, oh, you know, this was just as good as this show, or this was better than this show. We love hearing that Philadelphia has some awesome shows, and the Sunday show with No Pressure at Fleshwater, Coyo was fucking fantastic. If you missed that show... You know those bands are playing? This is Hardcore. A little festival we're doing August 4, 5, and 6. August 4 is sold out. August 5, August 6, we got single tickets and two-day tickets. We added Beyond Repair, which is uh, Keith Barney, Mark Jackson, a bunch of the guys who were the original throwdown lineup, playing only the shit that they recorded for Indecision Records. They're doing a Indecision Records show Already that show is completely sold out on the West Coast, so we're happy to bring them out to the East Coast. Um, big friend, big fan and big friends <laughs> uh, in, from when we met Throwdown on their reverse tour in 1999. Crazy to see what that band led to, considering all the other acts that those guys were involved with at the time and what other bands they would do. And I think <laughs> Pain, Prayer for Cleansing, Throwdown, and Vain is an awesome way to go out at the end of the year for this hardcore, so that's and they're playing the Sunday show. So step it up, come out. Uh, the only other thing that's really worth mentioning is that 
this summer, there's a lot of hardcore shit going on. And a lot of people have been saying that commercially, this is the best it's ever been for hardcore and making all these assumptions and projections to try to be ahead of the curve and say, I'm the guy who said this. Only thing I tell you is that as long as there's people like Ben Stuckey, Bob Wilson, Greg Falchetto, King John Scanlon, that motherfucker just put a crazy second, I have two sold out shows probably by now, those GB shows. These are the people that make hardcore what it is. What gets written about in the publicity what gets talked about on social media is secondary. It's the doers. Sam Triple B. I mean, I could list names for, for hours. This podcast first started about the people who do the shit and make the shit happen. And it still is. It's great to hear people excited about hardcore. But really, what needs to be celebrated is that we are well over 40 years of an amazing underground culture. And from time to time, it gets a little bit of flurry in the social media. And then other people check it out. And dorks like Shaq go ahead and share for internet um, interactions, mosh pit videos to people who don't know what's going on. It's more important to be present and be supportive of these bands that are coming out and doing things than being on the internet and jockeying for position for number one fanboy of a band who is already well into commercial success. So instead of capping on the internet, go out and mosh for fool's game. That's all I got to say. Let's rock. Let's get into Dan Nastasi, Monkey Pup, Doggy Dog, and now Kings Never Die. Um Ung Sung, huge part of a sound that would explode out of northern New Jersey, New York. I mean, it's not really seen or spoken of much, but Mucky Pup was a huge influence for the people that would eventually play in the bands like Bulldoze themselves. You ask, the, you ask Zach from up, go back to the episode I did with Zach. He's going to bring up Mucky Pup. You know, like these are things that get kind of left over in the sands of time where a guy might be in a band you may never have heard of, but that band might be the catalyst of the band that you fucking love. And that's definitely the case with Dan Nastasi, and his story is fucking awesome. I also like guys that never put down the guitar, never walked away, or, you know, never looked back angry at what wasn't accomplished. So, let's get into Dan Nastasi. Let's fucking go. Welcome to the show. Not only one of the most fabled guitarists that has crossed from New Jersey hardcore to New York hardcore, but still continues to bring everything he's got to the foray into without aging, making you feel old into your fourth decade of doing fucking hardcore shows. Dan Nastasi of Mucky Pup, Doggy Dog, and now Kings Never Die fame. Also who celebrated quite a bit of a, a run with Murphy's Law as well. A, lot. Uh, a year and a half run. A Dude, year and a half. Run. That is a year. <laughs> that is their year though. A fucking great, I mean... That was a year. 1989 to 1990, man. That was a year. I, I, I want to get into that, but the thing about you specifically is that there's a lot of guys that rest on laurels, and I don't ever see that in you. In fact, I think you're one of the few people at your age with the bands that you've been in that are pursuing new music and not chasing the old glory as much, and that's what makes Kings Never Die very interesting, is that most people from the New York, New Jersey hardcore scene tend to stick to the things that the people know, because obviously you have people up front, but you, you have no problem playing new songs and, and trying to earn respect with new people, which is not as usual as you would think, you know? Yeah. It's funny because now that the record has been like circulating and there's, you know, and, and, and our record label, for, for the actual full length has done a great job of getting it out there, but like for reviews, but now that we're seeing them, it's funny how every, every, I guess opinions are that this record, now that you have like a, 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 a 10 song sample size really doesn't sound like any other band that I've been in before, uh, or Danny or any of us really. So 
I take it as like a huge compliment. And I think it's a reflection of the music that I love. You know, like we're all, we're all ripping off each other. You know what I mean? Like you hear something you love and you're like, and it influences you whether you want to admit it or not. But I think, uh, I think that this is a situation where it's something that like, I know I love to do. Larry loves to do like everybody in the band loves to write music, create music, perform, like play. And it's like, you got to be grateful that you still have the love to do it. And, you know, I had like a 15, 12 to 15 year period where it seems like I really wasn't that active in it. And it's true. And I'm just grateful that I'm able to do it. And I'm really grateful that I didn't go back and try to recreate Mucky Pup or recreate Dog Eat Dog or, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, you got to do what you feel in your heart and it's got to be real. And I think people see right through that if you don't. Well, I think specifically those two bands, they're, they have such a unique presence, not only in the scope of like hardcore music, but Mucky Pup today, I think would go over so much on the TikTok world because you guys would have had you guys would have had skits you guys would have had so much fun like with the with the world the way that you could present music in the way that TikTok is or the way the Facebook reels were and yeah you don't really see hardcore bands actually going out and doing a band for fun like the fun part is you get to play shows but Monkey Pup was like a legitimately fun band and they made fun of things and they made the shows fun. And that's not your fault, but it's an like almost like an antiquated outdated thing because hardcore shifted so much towards only what was able to make people go off on the dance floor. And it was like, you know, like a live thing, but Mucky Pop had some of them crazy live shows and you influenced so much of what would be New York hardcore, which would then waterfall and cascade down onto all the bands today. And I, and, and since you were bringing up influences, I never read, I know that you got into playing guitar really early, but I never read what was, what was the music or anything that you actually listened to, to like influence you to start even playing. Uh, well, I picked up a guitar when I br- I literally broke the bone that is your kneecap. Wow. Otherwise, I probably I maybe I would have never picked up a guitar, but I did it because I was like at a commission for six months and my neighbor was playing guitar. And so I begged my mother to get me a guitar. And all we did, and I'm I've always loved music. I mean, you know, cl- the classic story, you've heard it a thousand times. Like I found the doors kiss freaked me out, man. It was like, it wasn't just the music, which I thought I love kiss. I think it's fucking, I, you know, well, I think it's what was raw it, rock and roll. What was your first record that you uh, heard from kiss? Like what era? Destroyer was the oh, first. Okay. No, 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 that's not true. Uh, alive. I think alive one was the first actual record that I got. But Destroyer was the record that freaked me out. And I don't remember what year it was, but I mean, it was literally like a cartoon and the intro into Detroit Rocks. You know, it was just incredible to me. But I love Black Sabbath. And then when Ozzy left Black Sabbath and had Ozzy Osbourne, me and my neighbor learned how to play guitar to Blizzard of Oz. And I would play the rhythm and he was trying to learn how to play the solos. And even at that point, I was like, ah, fucking solos are just fucking waste of time. Like to me, it was like, eh, okay, you, you play the solos. I want to learn how to play the rhythm. And then, uh, you know, A Diary of a Madman came out right at, after that. And then it was like deep dive back. Now I want to like, I want to play that ozzy sounding metal guitar to the doors you know like i want to tell you about a texas radio and the big beat you know what i mean 
So I think right away, playing the guitar, for me, playing rhythm guitar was only like a tool to, to create, start to create music, like start to write music. I've never, ever, ever been like, I want to be a great guitar player. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a rhythm guitar player, but I, w I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to, like, write my own songs. And then, you know, you bring it back to what you said about Mucky Pup. Like, Mucky Pup, 100%, the live, the live aspect of Mucky Pup. And look, Mucky Pup to me is like, it's not the 90s. Like, the boom was the 90s, right? Yeah. It like we recorded Can't You Take a Joke in 1986. My parents signed my record contract. I was 16. That's so cool. I was a junior in high school. And we recorded a boy, a uh, uh, Can't You Take a Joke. And it didn't come out until 88. I was a senior in high school, I believe, or right after I graduated. No, no, before. And then we literally, the record came out and we were absolutely one of the first bands that went to Europe. It was like Gorilla Biscuits. I believe Agnostic Front had already been to Europe. It was us, but we were not like a New York hardcore band by any stretch of the imagination. We were like really like a comedy core band. You know what I mean? We were what a 16 year old, uh, you know, like say it the way it is. A 16-year-old jacked up on Coke, that's what I wrote about. You <laughs> know what great. I mean? Like, like, we could lie about it, but the fact is, a can't you take a joke in a boy in a man's world were written and fueled by cocaine. So, so you know, it's factual. And it was, you know, we, we weren't afraid to do whatever came out, and the person that gets the most credit for it I might be the one that that was, uh, let's say, like the main writer or the idea of the songs, but Chris Milnes was the 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 brains behind the band. You know what I mean? He was older than us. He knew how to get the band out there. You know, we literally had demo tapes out. Uh, I even forget the names of them. Uh, no responsibility. It was like these crazy demo tapes, and we were going out to Scranton. Going out, you know, we were playing everywhere. Like we were playing in East Stroudsburg. We would go up to Connecticut. Uh, our first record came out. We were going. Uh, what was the place up? Up in um, streets, Club Benet. Oh yeah, Jersey down the shore. Like yeah, we. He is the guy that got us in all those clubs, and people gravitated to it, and. I'll go back to something that you I heard you and Jay Reason talk about, which was an incredible anytime I hear him on a podcast, it's like an education for me. Uh, I'm like I I am fascinated by just his story and how he looks at things. But he said it, you guys talked about it. It was a different time. People were wide open to a, a, a way bigger array of music like how many shows sick of it all a mucky pup played together back then it was like you know it's clobbering time and then it was like you know here it comes like uh you know mr president your policy like it, they were polar opposites you know what i mean but people accepted so much more absolutely you know i think there was a period in time in the mid to late 80s where the punk part with the half political, half tongue in cheek, the ability to kind of make fun of itself was still mm -hmm. deeply embedded in hardcore. And then within the time where you get to like 89, 90, that starts pulling away. You know, there, there's still bands doing yeah. it, but it's not a focus. And, and, and that pulls the thread where hardcore kind of shifted to try to be a little bit more serious. And, yeah. and I don't understand because obviously I wasn't at the physical shows, but there were so many bands. I mean, that, that had a, a huge influence from the very first hardcore bands had tongue in cheek names, had really aggressive songs with very um, satirical lyrics, even satirical artwork. 
And a lot yeah, of that ludicrous, absolutely, yeah, the immaculate conception, you know, which became yeah. scatterbrain. Nobody did it better and stands the test of time in terms of they did it more on like a, a, just a fun party aspect, like like Murphy's Law did it the best, like Jimmy just did it the best, and it's never stopped. And to me, the greatest frontman in the history of hardcore music is Jimmy is uh, is James Dre- uh, Drescher. You know, Jimmy's just the best that ever did it. Uh, but that is kind of the thing. Like, it was a fun party band, light up the room, you know, and Mucky Pup kind of had like a similar kind of, but it was more about the comedy of, like, the satire of it. You know, Batman, the Butt Ripper, and PTL, and I mean, it's just like childish uh yeah, it's I'm literally literally funny shit. And I and I think today today's hardcore is very uh to me it's because I'm older, it's a little LARPish. Some of the lyrics are like they, they have to fit a certain pattern to entice yeah. the young kids. Yep. It doesn't come from the heart. It doesn't it's not as great. I mean, you can even see it in some of the younger bands, the banter has to be serious, like there was a moment I th- I think that shifted things, where the great hardcore frontman had a lot more charisma than a lot of the ones who are in popular bands now. And it's not taking anything away from them, but they no. never had to build up the ability to get a rapport going with the crowd. And 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 to your to speak to what you were saying, uh, Siv and a ton of guys have said the exact same thing. They said there was a minute where no single person in hardcore could have a better interaction and control and just be a part of the show the way Jimmy was. And I had not seen that the entire time until the Thompson square park show. And I seen Jimmy in front of like thousands of people. And that was, I mean, they're hurling beer cans they're doing stuff. And someone said like, that was like a, a like almost like a um, vintage. A, yeah. It was like a time traveling back to when yep. it was just fun because hardcore shifted so much. Well, if it's not, if you're not doing it, if it's not fun for you to do, you shouldn't be doing it, first of all. But Jimmy is 100% authentic. This, that is who he is. Whether you meet him, you see him out someplace, he's the same person. And he has an unbelievable, uh, he has an unbelievable uh, gift of connecting with people and looking in their face and just communicating with people. And, you know, that was my kind of my point. Like, you know, Chris, he he could do, he did it more of like, he was like an entertainer and he tur- started to turn like the show into like a fucking show, like crazy shit, you know, uh, funnels and cowboy. I mean, it was just like, it looked t- uh, in all honesty, eventually it got to the point where I was like, this is just like lunacy. Like, you know, uh, you know, like personally, I I just grew out of it. You know what I mean? Like I musically grew out of it, which sounds. Sounds pretty douchey because I'm you know, I I wrote Hippies Hate Water and I wrote Batman. Like I wrote these crazy songs, but, you know, like does it you know, Joe, like when you were 16 years old, what were you thinking about? What were you doing when you were 17? And then when you were 21 or 22, you were a different man. Absolutely. We've lived through. And I lived on the road from 17 years old up until 20. I lived on the road. I mean, I was gone. Like between Mucky Pup, the cycle of being on the road, joining Murphy's Law, right on the road in the U.S., back to Europe, another, you know, two months in Europe. Like I grew up. And I'll also say that about Jimmy, like Jimmy taught me a, a, an incredible amount about life enough. He taught me so much that I had to be honest with myself uh, after about a year and a half and just say, hey, man, like this is this Murphy's law is is. I'm faking it like this is not me. This is you. And and I I felt I was doing an injustice by being a part of a band that it it wasn't my life at that point. After the age of eighteen, I didn't drink, 
I mean, I didn't put a drug in my body, drink a sip of alcohol until the age of 27. Like nothing, totally straight edge. If you want, you know, if we want to clap, like from the age of 18 to 27, nine years, I was 100% sober. And I'm literally on the road with the, the greatest party in the world every day. And it was just, it, it was just too much for me to be able to, to comprehend, to deal with. You know what I mean? Do you think it was because you were, were you not a part of the writing process of the songs or like, you know, coming from Mucky Pup where you were yeah. such a, like you, it was, it was your art, it was your music. So you were embedded in it where you were a higher gun for Murphy's Law. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't my, it, it, they weren't my songs. I was playing their songs and believe me, I love to play them. I mean, I grew up listening to them. Like it went from Ozzy Sabbath. And then I found the dead Kennedys. And when I found the dead Kennedys, I was like, Oh my God. And Mucky pup is unbelievably the writing style influenced by the dead Kennedys and a lot of like metal anthrax metallica you know those bands have a you had a huge influence on me at that time and mucky pup kind of sounds like a thrash metal uh dead kennedy's satire 16 year old kid that doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about but making fun of everything and having fun doing it that's what that's what the band was that's what the content was of the band and for the time period it worked and and i gotta be honest you're like i see it I could be crazy, but I see that time coming back where people are really open minded to a lot of different styles of music within the same show. You know what I mean? Like I know and look, I know from Kings Never Die, like and, you know, like. We don't really sometimes fit on a bill, right? But I think it it's coming around where people are a lot more open minded to shows with a lot of diversity within the show. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I I think that time is like coming back, uh, you know, maybe also because we appeal, uh, you know, the, the numbers say we appeal more to the 25 to 40 year old crowd, but I think we do appeal to like a bit of a, a little bit of an older crowd. You know what I mean? So, maybe an older crowd might be a little bit more uh, open to whatever type of music, you know, different styles of music within a show. Yeah. I think the younger kids, sometimes they come with the idea that they're open to it new, but because they're not really well-versed in things, they are uncomfortable around stuff that's not in their, um, what they already expect at a hardcore. And yeah. I mean, the early 90s specifically was the complete opposite of that, where you show up at a show and because there wasn't, I mean, there was still a lot of hardcore bands, but there wasn't that many times where you didn't go see a show and there was a random opener that you're like, what the fuck is this? I mean, we saw a show that was Sam Black Church opening for fear and you know, in Philadelphia in the, in the early, actually it was like, I think it was 94, 95 in South Street. And it was a Sam Black Church anti-scene and fear and you're like how the fuck did the same black church get on that and the mixed bills were really interesting and i, I you heard me talk about it before we're like corn yep. orange nine millimeter all these bands all uh death tones all open for hardcore bands in the 90s because there wasn't a place yeah. for them and i feel yeah. like in term what we got going on with some of these bands that don't really have shows we're gonna get some of them back i like that you said with with like a, like a pure honesty that you were you were having fun because you're with Murphy's Law, but you realize it wasn't your own because a lot of people are content just to be like, hey, I'm in this band now. And, and that I don't I, I think it speaks well for you still wanting to have a creative influence in what you're doing. And also yep. because you had a direction in mind. I mean, dude, especially at that point. I mean, when you did that tour, that was like right after back with a bond came out. Right. Or was it? Was, that it was it was fucking incredible. Joe, it was yeah, that like, had to be like back with the bong just came out. It was like I think the first show I played was at the Chance Theater. <laughs> I think it was the Chance Theater. I mean, it was like sold fucking out balcony. It like the you know the Axis Club and uh, uh, the Channel in Boston, Chicago. Like it was just un. I was like 
I mean, Monkey Pup at the time, don't get me wrong. I mean, we were like a three, a 200 to five, 600 draw type band on our own at that point after uh, like after the first record and then A Boy in a Man's World came out. And then it went to like playing with Murphy's Law where it was a thousand to 2,500 people everywhere. I mean, it was just, you, like, you, you hit it on the head. It was the beginning of the time when live shows and this music, 89, 90, all the way through 95, 96, just exploded. The scene just exploded. And it exploded because people were open-minded to different styles of music playing together. When you think about all the bands that you played with at that time, did you even realize because of your age that you were in like what would some would consider like a golden age for hardcore and punk at that minute? Or was it? I, I had I had no idea, but I knew when I was in Murphy's Law that this was like so special, and it it killed me to have to admit to myself that this was this was not mine, and you know. At that time, like, Mucky Pup, like, you know, my good friend Sean Kilkenny wound up playing guitar in Mucky Pup when I left. And he filled in and did all the touring pretty much for A Boy in a Man's World while I was in Murphy's Law. And then after that touring cycle, Mucky Pup was like, we got to make a record. And I think it was right at the time where like, and, and don't get me wrong, like Murphy's Law was Doug Beans, Chuck Valley, Jimmy, and me at the time. And we were writing like fucking prolifically, musically. We had written a, an album and a half worth of music. Uh, it just wasn't, it just wasn't coming together like, lyrically with the music and so so we were writing all the time and man i would love to hear some of those tapes because some of that music i thought was just like i thought it was incredible man i really did i thought it was just off the hook um you know i get a little sad like just thinking about like you know chuck and yeah i was gonna actually ask you how yeah. how was to be able to just at your age playing with someone like chuck just 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 the kindest like just like a, a fucking phenomenal human being just absolutely all of them i mean i can't tell you first of all they're all fucking incredible musicians doug beans was like i mean i'm joe i'm telling you man what a drummer and chuck valley was just like like he was incredible. These guys could play. And at the time, I mean, I could, I could fly. Like, you know, we, it was like, boom. You know, I mean, I, I'll, I'll be honest. Like I was no Todd youth. I, I didn't have that perfect style for Murphy's law, Yeah, but I could play. I could rip the shit, but it was a little bit, uh, you know, at that time we were playing things a little bit more like, like heart, like, you know, like that's when like, the more metallic uh, picking. I'm glad fast. that's what I was going to say to you. The leeway influence. Well, <laughs> well I, there's a moment in hardcore where you hear live videos where the open strumming or the tighter punk strumming disappears from songs that you hear on the record, the, op the different strumming, and yeah. becomes that almost metallic, you know, uh, everyone started picking completely yeah. differently. And I saw I saw a Murphy's Law video like that, and I was like, even Murphy's Law's players were picking up on it because I, I think it was a natural progression because it sounded meaner. You know, it really does yeah. sound meaner live. I think for Murphy's Law, it was Todd Youth. Like, Todd Youth is a fucking, like, was the fucking daddy, man. That dude could play fucking guitar, any style. Like, so I think Todd, if you listen to Back With a Bong, that's Todd Youth. And Todd Youth started to play, you know, listen to Panty Raid. You know what I mean? Like, 
Todd Youth started to play the first album stuff like his style, and the whole scene uh, just got a little bit tighter. Sounds got a little bit better. The equipment got better. You know what? Like, guys got better at playing their instruments, and there's no doubt that, you know, let's say 89 to 90 to 91 and 92, that, you know, like, Guys became better players and bands started to the influence of the metal guitar sound and definitely the influence of adding the metallic sound into hardcore combined to make really New York hardcore. You know what I mean? Yeah, I definitely think that. In the- and I loved it. And I fucking loved it. Like, you know, when I heard Just Look Around, like, when I heard the second, like, when I heard Just Look Around, Joe, I fucking, I, I dropped. I was like, this is the greatest. Born to Expire, I was like, oh, my God. Oh, like, the most influential album, I believe, was Born to Expire. But for me, Just Look Around was like, that was New York hardcore. Like, Boom, put the put the butter, boom, put the put the butter, but like it was over, man. The groove, the sound, guys that can fucking really play, like that is when I just became uh a New York hardcore music lover. Like I love the style of music, the aggression, the sound, uh, and and those bands and leeway had a massive influence. On Dog Eat Dog, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Murphy's Law and Leeway and Just Look Around and that, that I mean, and hip hop, you know, I'm a huge Ice Cube fan. Like, math, like I love Ice Cube. I've always loved it from America's Most Wanted to Death, Death Certificate. I think of the two best hip hop, two of the best five ever made. You know what I mean? So uh, you combine those things. And John Connor loved hip hop as well, as long as well as like Murphy's Law and, you know, like more of like the punk hardcore bands. And I mean, I'm it's it's always about the people, Joe, like, you know, you, you take the influences of the people. And I know for me, I didn't want after doing the now Mucky Pup record after Murphy's Law. I, I was like, I want, I want to, fu- I, I want the content to mean more. I want to write, like, I was way, way more driven to write songs. And I was influenced by the things that I loved, the music and the bands I loved. Well, I think about New York hardcore. Obviously, you can have people, uh, will raise, will raise and say Crow Mags. I also think, Born Expire was completely on such a different level. Yeah. And it, co- it, it, it coincided with the thrashier bands you brought up, you know, Anthrax and such. And and, and it, it, it needs to be said that the influence of Metallica growing for, out of the underground and to be like a bigger thing really added those down picking thrash elements to the punk scene, to the hardcore scene. And I think that I agree entirely by the time Just Look Around comes around, the, the bands from New York had a different edge, you know, just that it, California had a different thing. Everyone. And, I, and this is kind of one of the sad things about today with Spotify and everybody doesn't have a regional sound. You know, there's a lot of homogeny. Yeah. The band could be from anywhere and it's going to sound like this, where there was a, an attraction to those tight riffing structures that Metallica and Anthrax had. But with the rhythm, the downbeat, you know, that it is just, again, emblematic of New York's uh, not only love of punk rock and CBGB's life, but also of hip hop. And yeah. so many kids from everywhere, from any city in the East Coast, you talk and it's like, oh, well, you know, I grew up in this kind of neighborhood. I was exposed to this kind of music, but hip hop was always around. And so it's a natural it's a natural, you know, way that the two blend. When Doggy Dog comes into the picture, I think it's really cool because hardcore 
still didn't have this. I mean, they had different moments, obviously the black flag moment and the crow mags moment, but doggy dog comes out right at a time where I think people started perking up and going, maybe this hardcore thing's going to get a little bigger, you know, like I, I always tell the story about the first time I saw doggy dog was, um, Downset it was man ball downset doggy dog and hard response in Philadelphia at JC Dobbs like 95 or 94. Yeah. Late 94. And I was, uh, I was a kid and Kev one was moshing and hit me. And I ended up being outside, not remember being hit, yeah. <laughs> but that, but doggy dog, even then could stand with the man balls, the downsets, like, it, it was it was the power of those riffs and the bounce. I mean, people people today they may see the stuff and the horns. They may not, they don't realize that was a fucking dangerous band to be in the floor for. Like literally, that was Dog Eat Dog had a had a a legit intimidating presence from all the way down here in Philly, all the way up. You know, we've seen them a, you guys a couple times in North Jersey, and I'm gonna tell you. Doggy Dog brought some of the heaviest breakdowns and people really being out of their fucking minds, man. Yeah, I mean, it was the Warren EP. Yeah. Right? Like, Doggy Dog, now we're talking like 91, 92. You know what I mean? Like, so the Warren EP, uh, first of all, Kev won, uh, you know, rest in peace, obviously. So I don't know if you know, but. Kevin was super tight with us from day one. And Kevin actually, I wouldn't say he worked with us, but he was one of us. Everything we did uh, when we started playing clubs, Kevin was a part of. Up until when we played the Academy Theater, uh, really, we played the Academy Theater one week after uh, the Warrant EP came out. And unfortunately, there was just a situation that just just got a little out of control. I mean, it was, I, I don't I don't want to get into it. File, it file under Kev one shit. <laughs> you know, like it's... Uh, it was I'll tell you, it was just incredible. I could I was so it was sad. I, I it broke my heart. But. um, You know, the Warren EP. Was fucking heavy. I mean, it and it, and it had like a groove and. You know, it was also a time where, like, we were trying to figure out, like, who are we? Like, what are we? You know what I mean? We also held some songs that were already written. Some of the original songs that that Sean and Dave and John wrote when I was still, like, touring with Mucky Pup, because they were now out of Mucky Pup. I did the Now record, and then I did the U.S. You know, the U.S. tour we did a, a, a huge uh, European tour. That's the tour that Biohazard, that we brought Biohazard to open up on. And when I got back from that tour, it was already known that I was, I was done, you know, I was done with playing in Mucky Pub. And literally, I think Sean or Dave or what, they were like, hey, you know, we've been jamming. We, you know, we have this, we started our own band. It's called F Troop. You should come down and check it out. And I went to, we always practice at Dave's house uh, in his mom's basement, the concrete basement. I went down and they played this song called Funnel King. Yep. Which wound up being on All Borough Kings. And I'm, Joe, I shit you not. It was like, bam, 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 bam. It was so fast. And it was, and I was like, but then it went, bump. And I heard it, and I swear I was like, I'd love to play with you guys. Like, I heard, like, let's just slow that down a little, you know what I mean? And it was really natural. I mean, we've all been best friends since we're four, since we're 14 years old. Dave was the bass player of Mucky Pup. Sean was one of my best friends, always helped us out. He took my place. John Connor, uh, 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 uh always traveled and toured with mucky pup like we were all best friends and and to this day we're still best friends like they're john and dave and sean god rest his soul are three of my best five friends in the world you know what i mean so it's real like you can't fake who your friends are these are my you know 
those guys are my family. Um, but from that day, we just sweated it out in Dave's basement. And I really say it was like the four of us getting together. I wanted to write a different way. That hearing that song really influenced me to be like, yeah, I want to like, I that's awesome. And we just kind of like, you know, there's like special moments where you kind of like catch a little magic in the bottle. You know what I mean? And it was it was that time. But you know, you got to remember, like that Warren EP and pretty much almost all of All Borough Kings were all written already when we released the Warren EP. I think the only song that wasn't really totally written was probably Who's the King and No Fronts. And that's because they hated Who's the King. They thought it sucked. I'm like, no, 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 no. way. I'm like, ba, 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 who the king, who the king? They're like, who the king? What the fuck? Like, you know, that. <laughs> you had, that's a, a you had to let that, you let, had to let that settle on them. You had to simmer it yeah, a bit. Yeah, yeah. And then No Fronts kind of came to be from a beat nut song. We were going to do, you know, we, 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 we had a role in like, we were going to play the limelight and the beat nuts were, we were going to do one of their songs. And I kind of took their music and transposed it a little bit to make it. And then I wound up taking that. And then we kind of redid the bass line. And then like all those songs, we all four of us worked together. None of those songs would be what they wound up to be without all four of us. You know what I mean? Like it's, there's always a guy that might come up with the ideas for the songs but it's always about the people and the four of us really had like, we had it going. Like we really, you know, we worked well together. We had a good idea as to what we wanted to be. It was like kind of fresh, kind of new. There weren't bands like using the hip hop influence so much in their music then we had the horns was kind of by accident. And then it was like, uh, why did we say it by accident? What do you mean by that? Well, you know, our friend Kevin Rock <laughs> had this big fucking saxophone, dude. It was, I don't even know what the fuck it's called. It was, and he was like, we had the song. Oh, bassoon. It was a massive. Yeah. That's called a bassoon. Saxophone. It's called a bassoon. Okay. I'm, I'm with you. And he was like, yeah, it was a bassoon. And he'll be the first one to tell you, like, you know, he he tried to play it the best he could, you know. And then it was like, you know, we got, you know, we knew this guy, Sudi, and he could really play horn. And then it was like, hey, let's, Kev, you play it. Hey, hey Dougie Wilson. We're like, yeah, you play too. And and Sudi, you, you, you get the mic, put the mic, right, you know. And then, uh, <laughs> and then we just started to, like, Who's the king was like a no brainer. Yeah. You know, blah, 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 blah. You know, and I have no idea. I think John actually hummed, somebody hummed something. But again, man, it's, it's about the people. Like you're in a band, right? Like you could have an idea for a song. It could be, you could have what you think is most of the song written. You get in the room with the right guys, they'll fucking turn, like you guys can make some, you could turn that shit into something alive. And, you know, I've always been searching for that since then. I've been cert, like, I want a fucking band. Like, you know, I've made mistakes after Dog Eat Dog. I mean, believe me, I made some like major fucking mistakes, making record a record I should have never made. And, you know, uh, what I'm doing now is like it's it's awesome man it's like I'm playing with four other guys that I really love they're fucking great people we're all doing it because we love to do it we love to write to, you know we love the, the art of do, putting it together and we all love to play live and we've had a you know a couple like we we never really had a, a drummer uh, until, you know, the writing of this really with like Danny being like the drummer. 
And now even our drummer, like, you know, he's in, you ever, he's in this other band, uh, Biohazard. And now they're playing. Uh, that's half a joke. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's. But, you know, I'm like, again, that's awesome, man. That that's that's who he is. He's Danny from Biohazard. You know what I mean? So, like, you guys help. Incredible. You guys help made him, though. You brought him on huh? that European tour, man. A lot happened for them when they went after Europe. Yeah, but I, I really, I, 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 yes, it exposed them to play in front of a lot of people at the time. Did you just, you know, no, would you do it out of friendship or did you see something in Biohazard that made you go, God, we got to be on the road with you guys? 100% honesty, Chris Mills. Chris Mills heard this band, but he was, I'm just telling you, Joe, man, the guy fucking knew a little bit about everything. He was in what was new. He was on Leeway before fuck dude. The, the, I don't even think the demo was fucking. He knew who Leeway was. He knew who Eddie was. He knew age. Like the fucking guy had his hand on the pulse of everything. And he's like, there's this fucking band in Brooklyn. I, I did not know. He told me who Biohazard was. And then we got the demo and we listened to it. And it was like, whoa. And I was like, this is fucking hard man like but at the time joe it didn't matter you could take a fucking street fucking you know you know hold my own like you could meet people were open to that you could have a fucking stomp down hardcore band play with mucky pup and uh you know the fucking mighty mighty boss tones like that was a great show you know like so it was Chris's idea. He's like, you know, they have this record deal with this little label, Maze Records, and think what it would do for them to bring them to Europe. And then we kind of hooked up. We met with them. We were recording the Now album when he brought up the idea of it. They came in. We, you know, they sang on the song Three Dead Gophers. Uh, you know, Billy and, and Evan sang on the song in the studio and everybody got along. They were, you know, they're fucking great. They, they're great guys. And uh, we were like, OK, we'll take you to Europe. That's you awesome. know, that's awesome. Chris is like, are you cool with it? I'm like, yeah, fuck what yeah. the fuck? great. You know, we didn't think, wait a minute, like we're going to we're going to bring these guys like, you know, nobody thought like that, Joe. Nobody thought. Yeah. It was just like, how cool would it be for them to go to Europe? You know, we had, I, we'd been to Europe four or five times or four times. Like, they went to Europe, and here's the deal, Joe. They fucking crushed it every night. You, they fucking crushed it. Like, Were you guys so, using MAD at that time when all that happened? Or was there no. totally different people at the time? Yeah, we uh, Mucky Pup used back, way back then, it was this, uh, it was a booking agent called Metalise. Uh, his name was Johan, and he was the first guy that brought Mucky Pup and did the next four or five tours before Mucky Pup hooked up with Rob Trommel and then, you know, so on and so on. Mucky Pup, I don't think, ever worked with MAD, ever. At that time going over, not only is it just wild. Murphy's Law, that first Murphy's Law tour was MAD's first, Mark and Uta's first actual proper tour. Wow. Half of the tour was with Medalise the tour company that I knew the first two or three weeks. And then MAD did the whole second half of the tour. And I mean, through fucking Italy and Spain and port. Like, I mean, it was, it was a fucking long tour. Man. You guys, nobody does six week tours. Anymore, nah, so. You guys, uh, you guys went to Europe at a time when, I mean, I, I as I pose, I hear everybody saying America has, has such a huge influence on the Western countries. You saw Europe when it was still raw and European for the most part. Yeah. And, and I have to wonder what that impact was on you just going there with the bands. Every place you play has a different uh, currency. It, it had to be, was it, was it just that kind of thing that you do? Cause you're so young. You don't even understand the impact of it. It was crazy, man. It was like Frank, uh, 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 Franks in France and, 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 uh, Deutschmark. Uh, what was it? D Dutch marks in Germany and fucking whatever the hell it was in Holland and Belgium. And, yep. and then uh, it was just crazy. It was just crazy. And to be honest, 
I had nothing to do with the business end of it, nothing to do with the money end of it ever. Uh, and, you know, now I look back and I'm like, I wonder what you get paid to put 1200 people in a club every night. You yeah. I mean? <laughs> like, but, you know, look, I'm sure every band that was going to Europe that early had no idea that we were all getting fucking ripped off. You know what I mean? Like, like Rob blind. So I don't really know. I wasn't even involved in really the finances of the band part of it either. So it was my own youth and stupidity. I'll just chalk it up to that, you know, but once everything went to the Euro boy, things were a hell of a lot easier. Fucking you know right. What I mean? uh, I, hell yeah. I think uh, in general, there's this, this like moment where Americans start traveling there and then it becomes for certain bands like, Oh, they went, I have to fucking go like, you know, yeah. like, and little by little, America really had a huge influence in Europe. And then via this, the bands who were able to make things happen in Europe almost had a second life just because of the the, the fan bases there. Biohazard, uh, Danny was on the show talking about their um, the way that the fan bases helped keep Biohazard alive. And, and I, I think it's just awesome to be exposed to this because, again, you're just some kid from the East Coast gets an opportunity to travel because of some fun music you get to play. Yeah. I mean, Joe, the first time that we went to Europe, I swear to God, we had no idea how we were getting, where we were going, what we were going to these little, ho you know, the, you remember the hotels with the, the little circle windows? Yeah. And the <laughs> dude, we were in a splitter with like, you know, and 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 all those tours were like that in a, in a splitter. I mean, you know, the Biohazard tour was just unbelievable. The first tour was unbelievable. The first night we played in Belgium. I know that for a fact. And it was it's three it's two hundred and fifty to three hundred kids to the get. I just it was just my we just had no idea that this was possible. How did these people even hear our music? Like, it was just unbelievable. It was such a shock. And also, we were so young, but we were so grateful. We were so grateful. Uh, and then, you know, to be able to keep doing it, I've never, ever, ever, ever had the opportunity to go on any tour that I have not been grateful for the opportunity to do it. Because you think about how many people have never had the opportunity. How many fucking great bands don't have the opportunity? And I mean, I'll tell you, like, uh, my band right now, like, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to work out a tour in Europe in November. Like, we're, you know, we're trying to work out the finances of it and get it locked down. But like, nothing's, nothing's definite. You know what I mean? Like, it's hard to get it together. Shit is expense. Like it comes down to the finances of it. You know what I mean? And that kind of sucks. Cause back then nobody thought about the finances of it. Like, how can you afford to go? They just sent you the tickets and yeah. you just got on the plane and went. Right. I, I, I did the exact same thing. <laughs> I was just so happy to be able yeah. to do something. I thought I'd never be able to. And I felt so blessed that, even now, looking back at it, it was like, nah, who cares? We did it. We played it. It was fun. <laughs> you know, like yeah. there has to be a moment where in this that or maybe there isn't a moment for you where you start thinking like, can I do this long term? Like, Where was your mindset after the different bands and these different successes that you've had? Like, what was the um, where were your head turning as Dog Eat Dog continues on? Like, did you start thinking further or like, what was your mindset with all these things happening all at once? Well, I never wanted to leave dog eat dog. And I don't think they wanted me to leave. Uh, I, I, they didn't want to have to kick me out, but you know, after in 1990, after the mucky pup now tour, all right. So much happened in such 87, 88, 89, 90. 
And, you know, at that point in my life, I was, hmm, I was 20 years old. I was 20 turning 21 in 1990. So don't do the math. But <laughs> the reality is I had met my wife. Okay. I met my wife about two weeks before I left to go on that now tour with biohazard. Okay. To go back to that quick, believe me, if Mucky Pup didn't take biohazard on that tour, biohazard still would have went to Europe and been every bit as big as they, they wound up being. That's my belief. It was just a good fucking jump start. You know what I mean? It was just a good kick for them. But, uh, but long story short, uh, I met my wife and I had a lot of different things in my life that like, were kind of like all coming to a head between 1990, 1991 writing. We started dog eat dog writing music, playing clubs, got signed to Roadrunner, put the Warren album out, went in the studio, recorded all Burrow Kings. You know, the Warren album was doing really good on the East Coast. Like, I mean, it was fucking great, man. Those shows a anywhere. Studio One, The Limelight, the Acad we opened for five. Believe me, Biohazard paid back at, at least me. Like, they paid us back tenfold when they took Dog Eat Dog to Europe. And I, that was the payback for, I. that was the payback for Mucky Pup taking Dog Eat uh, Biohazard to Europe. But those three years of building Dog Eat Dog, releasing Warrant, recording All Borough Kings, All Borough Kings comes out. In that time period, I had met my wife, got engaged, planned my wedding date. My, you know, my father, we have a family business that I was always working on. Like when I came home, you know, you know, the paving, concrete yeah. paving business. My father was like, you know, I, I, I you know, like I got to, I'm going to have to retire, you know, I'm like, so I got married April 30th, 1994. That was my, and believe, I got married so young, but it is what it is. I never could have, you can't plan in advance that this may happen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, Joe, I remember being in the lawyer's office when he was trying to explain to us our record deal with Roadrunner. And he was like, okay, now you understand that if you sell more than 500,000 copies, you're not getting your publishing money. That's so crazy. And I remember being like, are you out of your fucking mind? 500,000. Like, dude, who the fuck's going to sell? I think the biggest Mucky Pup record sold like 140,000 record. I was like, are you fucking crazy? Who the hell's going to sell? It was unimaginable, right? Yeah. So, but the reality was I made a commitment. I was getting married on April 30th, 1994. And the Dog Eat Dog opening up for Biohazard Tour started, I think it was April 17th, 1994. And there was no way in hell that I was going to cancel my wedding, right? Yeah. To go on this tour. So we worked out that we were, that Paris made, you know, yeah. Paris, good friend of mine, like he was going to go, he was going to go play guitar for me in Europe on the tour. And you know how it goes, right? He goes out. They do this fucking incredible tour. Shit starts, you know, it starts rolling a little bit. Another tour right behind it. You know, my best friends in the world were not at my wedding because they were on tour. And I couldn't have been happier that that we were on tour. That's the way I felt at the time. Uh, and then it just started to snowball. It was like this to this to this. And it was right at the time where it was like, I'm married. My wife was pregnant faster than I could turn around and look behind me. You know what I mean? And my father was like, you going to fucking take this business or not? Wow. And it came down to like, I had to make a decision. Like, 
what am I doing? Like, it was like I had two lives. You know what I mean? I know very well. And <laughs> so, you know, half of me, the regret is because I think that if we would have just stuck together, made the next record, I think it could have really, really, I think it could have been like, I think we could have really brought it to an incredible level. Because, you know, once you take one piece of that machine out, you're not going to make the same record. You know yeah, what I mean? Because the, the, not that they didn't make the, the uh, uh, play games wasn't the a great record that for, you know, those five guys together, the new five guys together, but Mopey was gone. I was not in the writing process and you're going to come to out with a different result. And, you know, look, uh, you know, they, they made the record they wanted to make the new unit. And it is, you know, it is what it is. Like, what am I going to do? You know, believe me, I made a couple of mistakes after that that I should have never made. So musically, you know what I mean? Uh, it, you can't control being a part of a band that every day of your life is pre-planned. You're, go, you're flying here, you're going here, you're doing this. Now you hear, you know. Like it was just too big of an animal for the situation and the commitment I made to ha have a family and take over a business. I just couldn't do both. And I made a commitment and I, I stuck with my commitment, you know, like I don't feel bad. I have three, me and Sheila, we have three incredible kids. They're healthy and we raised our family and I've done a lot of things along the way musically to feed the juice. And I don't, I don't regret anything uh, in terms of my decision. Of course, I regret not being there every step of the way and seeing dog eat dog all the way through. You know what I mean? But nobody could take the Warren EP or all borough Kings away from me. You know, it's a part of me. It's a, it's a part of the four of us together. Now, when you're, in this, I will say, um, uh, mature lifestyle. Is it hard for you to interact with music? Are you are you losing focus with music? Is shows like getting further off in the periphery? What's your relationship to as new music's coming out? Like, or is it completely just shifted completely into family business and the day to day? What was life like after the touring stopped? Well. One, I've never stopped listening. That's to music. awesome. That's awesome. Uh, ever. Like, I am a fan of, uh, I am a fan of not too many different styles of music, to be quite honest. You know what I mean? But like, I'm a fan uh, before I'm anything because I love music and I love music that like moves me. You know, um, I'm a fan right now the last 10 years of new bands that I, that I, I found that I'm so grateful. I found, I, I'll tell you one, remember that show in Philly when I was playing guitar for leeway, it was right after it was, I think it was right after or right before that. Um, you know, I'm your pusher song that I did that I wrote. Yeah. With we played that leeway show. Remember the show got moved. Yeah. In the snowstorm. Right. So it was hangman and regulate. Metal. Right, Mad Ball, Leeway, uh, Wisdom, Wisdom and Chains, which I cannot believe did not go on after Leeway. I mean, holy fuck! And and regulate. So, right there, that's four of my six favorite bands in the world. Regulate is one of my favorite bands. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. They're fucking fantastic, right? That was the first night I saw Regulate. Opened my eyes to a whole new band. I am a fan of Regulate. That was the first time I had heard of this band, Wisdom and Chain. That was like six years ago, seven years ago, yeah. probably. Yeah. Joe, that was the first time I saw Wisdom and Chains. And the next day, I downloaded every fucking record. I was blown away. Like, you know, I am a massive, like, the fucking songs, man. It's like, some. it's the best, it's the best for me, the songwriting is like 101. It's unbelievable. I love the band. I could never write like that. 
I could never write songs like that, but man, like it's my fit. It was like a gift from heaven that like I was able to be a part of that and found one of my favorite bands in the world. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I love that. Uh, I love the way that they build up in the album. I feel hardcore records sometimes may just put the four best tracks first and then everything else second. I yeah. feel thematically like a, a Wisdom and Chains record is not, this is almost like a uh, publicist writing, but it, it, it's the truth. The Wisdom and Chains record doesn't roll to just roll out the best songs in the front end of the record. It really is an experience and they have lulls, they have different buildups. They've got different uh, moments in the record. It, it, it definitely, each record has its own personal touch to it and art. Everything about a Wisdom and Chains record has always been stand out to me. And likewise, First time I saw them, I'm like, this is one of the best hardcore bands I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. It's a, every record is a ride. Absolutely. It's a ride. And you know what, Joe? Like, you could do that when every record has six, seven, eight, nine great songs on it. Like, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a little easier. You know, it's a little easier to do. But, I mean, look, for me, like, my personal opinion, it's one of my absolute favorite bands. You know what I mean? So, um, you know... I've always, always, you know, Sick of It All is my favorite band ever in the world. Do you follow all their newer records as it goes on? Ever? Are you fucked, dude? Uh, like, the last two Sick of It All albums are, to me, are two of, I don't even want to say what's better, but they're, to me, masterful. You know what I mean? Uh, Awake the Sleeping Dragon is an incredible fucking album. Last Act of Defiance is an incredible DNC. Fuck it. You know, I, I, it's song after song after song, like Road Less Traveled, the new record, uh, Bull's Anthem. It's just like, to me, it's they're two of the better Sick of It All albums. May I probably like them also because to me, I like songs. I like song structure. You know what I mean? I think that's pretty evident, like in Kings Never Die. Like, I like to try to like create a song with a message and the lyrics, and the re we work really hard at like trying to create a a piece and then another piece. You know what I mean? Like trying to create a story and a positive message or a message in each song, and a lot of that is like I love that in bands that I listen to. And I think Agnostic Front does it incredible as well. You know what I mean? Get Loud to me is, a, I, I love the record. I love the record. You know what I mean? I also love Victim in Pain. You know, I also love, uh, you know, Warriors. Like, I'm a fan of these bands. And I love how these bands kind of like, you know, they, 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 they're not afraid to switch the script a little bit and change it up and do what they're feeling at the moment. And I feel like we're the, like, I'm the same. We're the same. Like we're going to create music that we feel and it's real and it's honest. And there, you can't call bullshit. Like on our record, all the rats, there's no bullshit to be called. This is like true from the heart. And I think ultimately, and I'm, I hope that people see that and hear it when they listen to the record. And, and, you know, Joe, like, that's the hardest part. How do you get people to listen, to actually listen to your record? That's the hardest part. I couldn't agree more. I think in talking about song structures, especially AF and Sick of It All, those are two of them, the longest running hardcore bands, period. Yep. And they have... And Murphy's Law. Oh, yeah. Well, that was the, the, the difference is with AF and Sick of It All, there's a record every two or three years. So they have the option... Sure always of writing these songs with different outlets you know like i i do i do really wish that jimmy could get one more record i think that especially now in his later years it'd be cool to see him have i'd love to write it with him i'll text i'll text him right now we'll text him right now i would like to me he's the fucking grandfather like he's you know if 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 vinny's the godfather then fucking Jimmy's the grandfather. Like this fucking guy's the best that ever did it. I mean, I look, I, I love the man. I love the man. That's all there is to it. Well, 
dude, I, I, again, Jimmy really is it's like something completely special and hardcore and it's in his own right. And I'm, in a world of special characters and people that just define the genre and become icons, Jimmy is still stands out above them all. But I yeah. think what I'm saying with the songwriting is with AF and Sick of It All, it's not that they don't give a fuck about their record, but they wrote enough records now that they take chances that other people may. And they they're not as concerned with the criticisms because it's it's an it's an old hat. They've been at it so long that they're able to have these long discographies because they're always releasing new material and touring on them versus yeah. some of the older bands who have never had those next records out of fear of not being able to have this, they trap the same magic again. And I feel as if yeah. I, I, I feel as if and this is where you come into play. I'm, I'm on YouTube and I see this fucking Eddie Leeway pusher. And I'm like, what the fuck is he doing? Cause Eddie's amazing, but he's also completely crazy. So you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. And I put this fucking thing on and was just mind blown. And, and you have, you have this special talent of being able to go under the hood of something like a leeway and tinker around and get the engine running right back the way it used to be, man. Like to hear that, to hear that opening, the, the chord opening intro, and then that build up, And then, Oh bow, my bow. dude, yeah. it, there's so much cool rhythm in it in the beginning. And then when the big riff comes that opens and carries a song, yeah, it's such a classic tone classic style with an update and and i i I really wish she would have pursued more of that because to this day it's one of my favorite it really is one of my favorite leeway songs and i was always hoping to see him do more with that i one i totally appreciate that but the reason i appreciate is because even when i first talked to him and and he was like yo yo you 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 got you you got you got some songs. What do you what do you got going on? I love them, and I love Eddie. But that's, I love it. That's Eddie too. I, I fucking. I mean, I've spent a lot of time with Eddie, you know. But like, I love him. I've always rooted for Eddie. I'm so happy for him. Everything that he like, what he's done with his life. I'm also like, I love his attitude about the battle that he's in now, right? Because the last. You know, we played a show with them in Jersey. Uh, I don't know. It was about maybe about a year ago now. And he was like, you know what, B? He's like, I'm just going to do it until they fucking take me out. Like, until I can't do it. Yeah, like he's at, like, like, he's at a war or something. I love it. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's but how you that, have to be. It, yeah. You can't sit like, dude, there's no time. And, and. He's got one of the most classic voices. I don't care if he can hit it to a dime like he used to. He doesn't to or not. need to. I don't but ask. at the time, he was like, you know, you want to get together. You you got any songs? You want to write? And I was like, Joe, I'm not kidding. In my mind, we were standing at a club way out in West Jersey that he was playing. By the way, Matty Pasta was fucking playing guitar, fucking ripping it. To the T. Dude, he's a journeyman, man. He plays. He could play no, anything for anybody, man. He's so fucking yeah. talented, and he is so versatile. Matty Pasta playing leeway is the closest thing you're gonna get to leeway, and and I, and and I play with Eddie, and I'm just gonna tell you, like, I think I could play. That's a little bit of my style. Plus, I love leeway. Like, I I it it affected my life. I I'm a fan, but. The second he was like, you know, you know, maybe, we, you know, you got anything, you know, what do you think? And I was in my head. I'm like, I've had this riff in my head for so long. It is a fucking leeway song. And it was like, bam, bum, 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 bam, bam, bum, 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 bum. So I had it in my head and I was like, I do have a fucking I, I do have a song and we just do. We got together like just me and him. I was showing him some stuff. I had the bow, 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 bow. And we just we we actually tried to put together like three or four songs. But it was really about like what was he feeling vocally? You know, what I mean? like what did he feel? 
And I was like, look, this song, I said, Eddie, the only thing is the song's got to be called I'm Your Pusher. Because that's the song title that I have in my mind. I'm Your Pusher. And the only lyric I had was, I'm your pusher, bow, bum, 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 bow, 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 which he changed a little bit. You know what I mean? That's the only lyrical idea that I gave forth with the music to the song. And he went into the fucking, like I record, we recorded the song, you know, Booge, John Milnes played drums on that song. Uh, that's the original drummer of Mucky Pup. He's the guy that actually played the drums on the song. We recorded it in different sessions and Eddie went in with Laz and the original singer of El Nino, Christian. Yeah. And dude, they would not let him out of this room until he fucking recorded the lyrics, <laughs> till he recorded it. I remember when, when he I was rolling it, with them too. <laughs> dude, when I heard the song, I was like, Holy shit. Like I like it was just classic. So I'm really proud of it and I'm happy that I was able to do it with them. We haven't been able to like organize if we could do something else. I was already like deep into like writing. Me and Larry were already talking about like, hey man, let's make a band, but I have I'm like, I got like 20 fucking songs, but they're more like punk rock, hardcore songs. They're not like leeway style. They're, you know, it's like this, I don't know. I'm fucking with this new, I don't know what it is. So I kind of went off and like, we started to pump on Kings Never Die. And then, you know, Eddie's like, you know, he plays with whatever. And now he's got a really good fucking band playing with him. You know? I love Eddie Leeway. I think that, Hardcore affords us the opportunity to see some amazing, not only talented people, but just true characters. And also seeing the true character spirit that he has. Try to stay in touch with him as much as I can with everything going on in his life. And uh, another tragic figure in hardcore, because there was a minute in time where, you know, he could have been in a totally different atmosphere if they would have taken that band in a completely, you know, more... A, a, a direction away from the Chris Williamson ripoff stuff that all happened to a lot of the bands. I have to wonder if that's not something that sticks with all of your crop of friends and bands at the time, because so many of them had issues where in the height of success and the money's coming in, here's the people that were bringing you guys in and none of you guys were even in your late twenties and the money was just pulling oh. out. So it's, it, 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 I- I don't know where all this fucking money was. I, I have, I'm going to tell you right now. I have made zero dollars off Dog Eat Dog. Z- like, I don't, e- fucking Roadrunner have the money? Like, I have no idea. But like, I don't, I think people have a misconception. Like there's, you know how you make fucking money, Joe? You know how you make money. I get you it. fucking get out on the road and you fucking play live and make, and now that's the only way you're making money. And I'm sure I know those guys made money like, of course, when they were, you know, really fucking bringing heads in. But, you know, I wasn't a part of that. But as far as the albums, there's we all got ripped off. Like, I have not made a fucking dime off Mucky Pup Publishing, Dog Eat Dog Publishing, all these records. Like, I don't even want to know how many records. Like, it's just like I've never made a dime off them. So... And I've tried to get a, a publicist to go back. He's like, dude, it's bad record. You're never going to get paid. It was from years ago. You're not going to get it. Like, it just sucks, man. But whatever. You know what, man? I live for the next day. I'm looking forward. I don't look back. I'm grateful for everything I was able to do and every guy I was able to play with and do it along the way. I, I can't tell you, like, I really feel blessed. Like I've lived a lot of life and I'm grateful today. Like I'm looking forward to what's next. It's like we talked about before and you opened with when it comes down to it, Joe, nobody fucking cares what you did 20 years ago. 
or 25 years ago. Yeah, they might like say, hey, that was fucking cool shit. But like they're listening to what you're doing right now and they're going to say, I fucking dig it or I don't dig it or whatever. But if that music that I those bands that I was a part of then will get somebody to at least listen to what we're doing now. That would, I'd appreciate that. That would be fucking awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because, you know, like I, my heart and soul is, is in Kings Never Die. Like I believe in what we're doing. I love who I'm doing it with. And I love the music that we've made together, the, the, the whole process. Um, and I, I couldn't be more grateful for the people that I get to play with. Like, you know. I get to go like to rehearsal, you know, tomorrow night with, you know, fucking Danny Schuler and Evan and fucking Larry, the, the like Larry and 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 by the way, like our fucking singer Dylan fucking rips it, man. The guy's got a fucking massive voice. Like, I love it. You know what I mean? Like, I love it. And ultimately, anything you do in your life, Joe, there's no way you're doing anything if you don't love to do it. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree so more. So that's it. Yeah. So I'd love for for it, you know, it to get out there and more people to have the opportunity to hear it. And I'm hoping that this record does that. But the fact is that, like, if you don't love what you're doing, you're fucking fake. Yeah, you're half-assing it. You're faking it. Yep. Yeah, you're, you're, you're fucking fake. So if you're doing it and you're succeeding, but you hate what you're fucking doing and it's not really what you want to do, that's great that you're playing in front of 500 heads every night, but you're fucking fake as shit. Like, and nobody's ever going to tell me or us that we're fucking fake because we're doing it because we love to do it. I'm 50. I'm fucking 52 years old, man. Like, you know what? I try to take care of myself. I'm pretty fucking healthy. I just have my fucking neck split in half. I'm like recovering from that. I've never, I'm getting stronger. Like I can't wait to get back out on the road in June and July and fucking hit the road again. Like I'm dying to do it. I can't wait to go to Europe in November. I can't wait to fuck. I'm fucking, I'm good. I'm ready to go. So I think there's a lot of people in their thirties that are like, you know, maybe they're like, fuck this dude, this sucks. But you know, if you walk away, you'll you'll realize what you're missing. Like this is only so much. Like you got to be grateful that you have the ability and the love to do it. That's what that's that's what it's really about, right? Couldn't agree more. I mean, well, East Coast hardcore is built on working class people, <laughs> and to take us to all these different places is already a dream come true. But then to know so many people from so many different wild areas have all these like life changing experiences in itself is a reward, but it's also the people that we influence by the stuff that we do with the music. That is its own reward. You know, like yeah, you might've ran a paving and um, concrete company and yeah, and you run your own shirt company now, but it's in the experiences and the things that we give the world that give us the most joy. You know, I, I, yeah. I, I love doing shows because it's a service. It's not like a, it, it's not a PayPal service with like a charge. It's, this is what I can do to keep doing for hardcore. What hardcore did for me, you know, I, I, I find myself every day with emails and the commercial side of it, the more pro aspect to it annoys the fuck out of me. But if I have to go through a couple emails every day and try to be polite and we can still do shows and still continue to do the shit we do that we do like. I'll, I'll eat some shit and do it. But I find yeah. that the people that get to the age where oh, I don't have time for shows. And then they started, I, you know, like I, I've always hated the person that's been like, you still do that. And it's like, well, what else did you think I was going to do? You know, like, yeah. and, and there's never been a dis more dismissive thing than someone who goes on the internet and is, is kind of, it happens a lot with the Facebook stuff. You'll see it where P older folks are kind of like oh, more curmudgeon because they stopped and they can't believe people still do it. I bring all this up because you're not your average 52 year old in any regard, my friend. And the other day you sent me this text telling me you're fucking had full massive neck surgery. 
<laughs> but you did it in such a nonchalant way. I'm like, is he fucking serious? We were talking about it in this podcast. I'm like, and I, so when I was expecting, I was expecting you to just go get on here with like a halo or something. I don't know, man. You said you had neck surgery. I'm like, what the fuck I, did you do? I had to do it. Yeah. I had to do it. Yeah. I, I mean, I told you, like, my, my, I played probably the last six, seven shows we played before we kind of just shut down. Like the night before I had my, sur- I had my surgery February 13th. February 12th, we played in New York City, in the Bowery. And we filmed the video for Make Them Anymore from the record, the first video for the record. We filmed that video on February 12th. I, I'm telling Joe, I could not feel my hand. So what I do is, do I have the Gorilla Grip? I take the pick. I take the pick, right? And I was putting Gorilla Glue on both sides of the pick and my finger and I was gluing the pick to my fingers and playing the fucking guitar. I had a nerve pounding down my arm and I couldn't turn my head to the right. And the reality was over eight months, it was getting worse and worse. And I just, I had to do it. You know, so my right cervical nerve was being crushed. And so what they did was I had the surgery February 13th. They split. They split, you know, the back of my neck, like seven inches. They just crack you open and they go in. I had eight posts, two rods, and I had my cervical spine fused. And I was in the hospital for like a week. I was at home for like five days struggling, you know, like all neck braced up. And then like anything, man, you just like. You put your mind that you're going to like fight through it, get better. And then five weeks after the surgery, we filmed the video for Stay True in Philly at uh, at your buddy's warehouse. You know, the, the Shark metal machine. Yeah. yeah. Shark Media. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Evan hooked up. Evan gave him a buzz, hooked it up. Dave Causa filmed the video. We did like a sync, like just the band one day. Filmed everything like in the back alley. It was really awesome. It was fun to do. Oh, it's Mechanical Shark. I forgot the name. Mechanical Shark Media. Yep. Yep. Yeah, my yep. boy's Paul Sharky. Uh, I mean, dude, they got fucking beams in there. Like they must be from like massive high rises, like huge. So we filmed the video for Stay True there with Dave. That was five weeks after the surgery. Now I'm like 10, 11 weeks. And I got to be honest, I'm just going to physical therapy every day. I'm just doing what I'm told. And we're starting to play shows June 3rd is our record release show. So it's like you just you just fight through it, man. You know? Kings Ever Die is your project that you are really pushing hard. If you had to tell somebody succinctly, like – this is why this band exists and this is what we're doing. What would you be able to say to that? Uh, I would just say that it's honest and it comes from the heart. Like we love to play together. We love to write music together and like what why not you know what i'm saying like is there like why shouldn't anybody do what they love if you like to take if you like being a photographer why wouldn't you go out and take photos like i love writing music you know what i mean danny loves writing music we love doing it together larry's fucking you know he loves like and every guy contributes in their own way to what we're doing so you know, it's like we didn't do it because we thought we were going to, like, take the fucking world over. Like, you know, we're in our fort. Like, well, Dylan's young. Dylan just turned 40. You know what I mean? Evan, e- Evan, obviously, you know, and look, some of us are in other bands, too. You know, Larry still plays shows with Murphy's Law sometimes. Evan's obviously in Wisdom and Chains. And, you know, I still play shows with Dog Eat Dog in the U.S. when we play. And I always have. And I always will. So Danny obviously has Biohazard. 
but it's something that we love to do. We found each other to do it together. And I think we made a great record. So why wouldn't we continue to do it? You know, like why? I think it's awesome. I think it's awesome that you have that combination. Evan's one of the coolest players in wisdom. He gets kind of overshot because he's not as uh he's not as uh charismatic as Richie on stage. He doesn't really get the microphone, but don't let Richie hear this one. <laughs> well, you know, Richie's Richie's a hell of a fucking songwriter too, you know. Like the guy the guy is like relentless. He's a really good you know? composer too. He can pull shit together. Yep. But he's just like a he's also just like a hard working dude, man. Fucking guy goes to work, just had a fucking baby, you know, started a fucking record label, fucking writes me, you know, wisdom's not really writing, they're not really doing much. They play a sh you know, they play a great show here and there. Like the guy's still writing music. Why so why is he still writing music and putting it out on on uh, on Spotify and shit? Because he loves to do it. Yeah. So what's he supposed to do? Like hot, like not do anything because you know, their band right now is not writing a record. Like, you got to do shit you love, man. You get to the point where it's like, why wouldn't I do something that I love to do? Like, I, I want to do things that make me happy. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to fucking die with any regret. And, you know, I'm like, I'm, you know, like, we're not that old. Like, I don't feel that old. I'm not like some fucking beaten down fucking 50 year old. You know what I mean? Like we, you have the ability, you do something that you love to do, you know? And I, and, and, and look, I won't bullshit. Like I really went, I am in a new writing cycle. I'm in a new mindset of a new, like re-energized uh, flow of, I mean, we have this record that's done. We have an entire another record pretty much in the works of being written, you know, all the song ideas already written. And I just started writing other shit and other, and other guys are doing the same thing, you know? Well, so, I don't think you lose. I don't think you lose that. That's, I think that's the point of it. You guys yeah. never. And if I couldn't do it here, Joe, then I would be doing it like what I did with Eddie. I'd be doing it with other people. So it's like, I would love to hook up and write. I'd write for other bands that's where I, I was. Write. I was just gonna get to that. Project. I'd love to see you throw some riffs at some of these younger bands and see if they can put something together. Yeah, they probably go over better because they're younger. <laughs> not, uh, not just that. I think, <laughs> I think some young kids, I think young kids, they're influenced, but they don't, they don't know how to harness that. It's the one thing when a band really does it, like Combust. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They sound yeah. like the combination of if. Uh, killing time and breakdown. You can hear the riffs yeah. where they come from, and you yeah. know, and, and it's not even a rip off because it's an homage. So you're like, yeah. oh, I know where you got that from, but it's such, yeah. a, especially in this day and age, it's so awesome to hear a New York hardcore band sound like a New York hardcore band. And um, I think that uh, the thing that people who are younger don't realize is, fifty isn't the end of the world. I mean, I'm 42. I'll be 43 this summer. And I feel like only now is am I starting to really understand the world at least a small little bit. And I kind of laugh at this shit 20 years ago. And I laugh at this shit 10 years ago. Like, man, I really let that fucking get to me. I really let, you know, like yeah. it, the, the, it, with age comes a lot of wisdom. And when it comes to playing music, I think that there is still that cathartic energy that comes from getting a room with people and just going yeah. and just having it, whether it's in front of, when you play live, it's five or 500. I think that if it's in you, it's going to be in you, man. And I, and since the minute you started doing Kings Ever Die, I remember it was the end of that uh, weird leeway tour that didn't go so great. And you're like, dude, leeway is not doing so great, but I got this project. And, yeah. you, and you were we're at that little club on Voltage. like a Tuesday night. Voltage Lounge. I was like, Eddie, what? What? the fuck are we doing <laughs> well i mean and that was the issue is there was so much shit with that the end of that tour and yeah. i said we don't have to do the show nah because we'll come down and we'll do it yeah. you know and i'm like dude i don't know how it was it was a disaster but this yeah. is years ago now where you were just like no man i'm telling you we're gonna do this kids never die i got yep. this and, and like and there's always people like you that have this focus you have this idea 
and you center yourself where you put your energy into that, man. And I think that that's why it's going over so well already and why it's going to carry itself forward because there are people that phone it in. I don't, I don't see any phoning in with you, you know, like no, this has been- that's just never going to happen, Joe. Like I told, I, you know, it, but it is, it's easy to be like, Oh, this fucking, this fucking dude, this guy from whatever has like, you know, like you got how many bands like just pop up and then they're gone and then they pop up and then they're gone. And like, I don't have time. Like, I I did not have to get involved with starting a new band. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have to do it. I could have just continued to just work. And, you know, like you said, like, you know, I would love to write with other bands, even if it's a ghostwriter type thing. I'd love to have younger bands that they, that their ideas, and maybe I can work with them and help them shape the ideas. You know what I mean? Like I'd love to produce. I have a lot of stuff I'd like to do, but I'm not doing that shit now because I still have the ability to fucking do what I love to do. And, you know, until basically I can't do it anymore, uh, it would be dishonest to myself and I wouldn't do it to my bandmates to just say, ah, fuck this. This is not going the way I want it. Like, you know, we're four solid years in three and a half four years into releasing eps and the goal was just the first goal was just let's just release a full length record with covid as the in- interruption it took three and a half years to get that done joe yeah you know and now we have it and now it's good now it's going to kind of be like okay either people are going to fucking give it a listen and it's going to go someplace. It's not going to go someplace. But that doesn't mean I'm just going to, like, stop what I'm doing. Like, I don't. I would love for people to fucking, you know, connect when we fucking play. But the reality is I'm grateful that we get to play. You know what I mean? Like, I'm grateful that we get to do it. And, uh, you know. I, I just. I'm going to do it. When I say I'm going to do something, I fucking do it. You know what I mean? I said I was going to get married in 1994. I fucking kept my word and I fucking did it. I told Eddie I was, you know, okay, I'll do that. I fucking gave him my word and I fucking did it. And I said I was going to fucking start a new band and we did it. And that's it. Like, there's no reason for me not to do it unless people just don't like it. And you know what? I really don't see that. I see, you know, like spread out. It's a big world and a lot of the reactions really good. And there's always going to be people that don't dig it. But, you know, if I'm doing it, as long as I'm proud of it and I see that people are responding to it, of course, we're, of course why wouldn't I do it? Like, yeah. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I, I think the the balancing point is you you've done this long enough to know when, it's not hitting with people. So it's not something that you would just chase em- with, like empty, like to the ends of the earth. I see what you're saying. No. Yeah, definitely. Definitely not. But is this one, is know. this, is this thing out on upstate still? No. All right. So you got, you're doing it yourself. What's the deal? No, the deal is we did the, the first EP raise a glass. Yeah. Raise a glass. We did with upstate Yep. and it came out five weeks before COVID. Ah, oh, fuck. And it was actually doing, you know, I mean, the EP was doing great. It was like on, I think it was like 11 or 12 weeks on Cortex Top 25. It was, the record was doing pretty good. In fact, we had a a, a tour in Europe already pretty much set for October. Uh, 2021, every, yeah. Everything got shut down. Yep. And then my father got COVID. And then my, you know, and then I was dealing with that during COVID, but we did record a couple of songs with Jerry Farley. uh, And we had some other tracks that we had done with Laz. So we released like during COVID, like this song, Pure Gold and a video. We did a couple like deep, like total DIY videos where I, I literally like recorded them on my cell phone and I edited them on iMovie. That's how Uh, so many people do things though. Now that's awesome. 
yeah yeah it's awesome you know what it is free sounds fucking good to me man i'll put in i'll put in the work to you know to create some art so uh and then um you know it's not like we sign today like you don't actually like sign a contract with somebody you know what i mean yeah so mario and kim at upstate were fan like fantastic uh we were already trying to like get this full length record out and you know it was like people were starting to play shows again and thankfully and gratefully richie uh and tim and soda were like you know we'll we'll if you guys want to put out this ep like you know four songs we'll throw it out on fast break i mean we can't do vinyl but like we'll throw it out digitally and we were like you know what, man, we're playing like we got all these shows booked and, you know, we had this this Life of Agony run thing we were doing. We were playing the Black and Blue Bowl. You know, we were playing, uh, you know, the Holiday Jam, like, you know, thankfully. And we were like, let's fucking get something out. And it was unbelievable. Like they literally in four or five weeks, the whole thing, they got it up digitally. So that Good Times in the Bad EP basically came out digitally. You could go to Fast Break Records, I believe, and get uh, CDs of it. Uh, but that came out. And then uh, we wound up trying to finish the full length. Um, you remember Holger Koch yeah. from Nuclear Blast yes. back in the day? Holger now has uh, an entertainment company, Flying Dolphin Entertainment out of Germany. And he started a label called Metalville. And he works with Rough Trade Distribution. Fuck yeah. And yeah, and he works with, you know, Nuclear Blast Distributes Forum in Germany. And they were willing to work with all the partners that we wanted them to work with. Like, we were like, look, we you have to work, like Cortex has to be a priority. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they were totally open to it. We were able, thankfully, to be able to like recoup some of uh, is some of the funds that like you know we spent on the record you know what i'm saying and we were able to get the funds to finish the record and you know they have like you know full pr market like it's a full length album and all we wanted to do is just put out a full length album and work with a company that you know it, that it was hopefully going to really have like, you know, a, a push behind it. You know what I mean? And we're super grateful. Every single thing that they said that they're going to do. They followed you know, like That's awesome. They're doing everything. And you know what? There's no excuses. It's like they're doing their job. I think we delivered a fucking great record. I mean, I love it. I think it's a really good record. I think if people listen to it, there's something for everybody in it. It's certainly not like a, you know, beat down record. It doesn't have like, you know, huge breakdowns, but it kind of does. Like if you like old school hardcore and some sing along, it's, you know, it's metal. And, and I also think that the record kind of like we talked about before, I think the record kind of takes you on a ride a little bit. You know what I mean? It's especially the B side of the record. I think I like the B side more than I like the A side, to be honest. I love when so, people take the time to have a dissertation between the two. I feel like sometimes records come out and it's just everything's heavy loaded and there's no thought on the vinyl or the cassette idea from back yeah. in the day where you were excited about like, oh, you know, the second side had had some tracks, man. Yeah, I mean, have you heard the whole record or no? No, I've not heard the whole record. Okay. Uh, do you have? Do you have? You have one of those record players? I have record player. I have that. Have <laughs> Here, I have. I'll I'll mail you this. Fuck yeah. But like you know, look, man, I'm I'm so grateful. Like, they did the vinyl. Total creative control. They let us do art wise exactly what we wanted you know what i mean like it's this is the, the limited edition glow in the dark vinyl there's another pressing that's going to come out that i think is going to have dark maroon vinyl they did like digipacks and fuck it like I, you know like when you 
hand your baby over like it's it's everything that we were just hoping that we'd be able to do and we're just super grateful and we're super grateful for upstate records for helping us get going and we're beyond grateful to fast break for getting out the four song ep which i fucking love man i mean i i i dig that ep you know we did a killer track with with uh with joe you know with with jotham oliver on it yeah um my wall back there. and yeah we did a great track with him and on the album the only song on the album that's on the ep is we re-recorded side by side oh awesome for the album and that's the last song on the album uh but i think it's really cool man like side b starts with like an old school intro like heavy intro type piece of music into a song never in my eyes which is the song that the label thinks we should have released as a single and then it's got uh danny Schuler's favorite song on the record is we need the truth and then it's got uh an updated quick version of the juice and then it's got side by side and the first three songs we released were make them anymore which is the fifth song on the first side the song stay true is the song thank you so much for playing it man I know I already told you, but I wanted to thank you again. And the label just released like uh, a lyric. We really had nothing to do with it. They made a lyric video on their own and released a lyric video for the song This One's For You, which is a song that we're going to make a video for like three, four months from now after the album comes out. You know what I mean? But like. They had a plan that they wanted to do. And we were like, if that's what you think is the right thing to do, do it. And we had ideas that we wanted to do. And they let us do those things. And, you know, most importantly, man, anybody in the world can get the record easily. It's available all over the United States. It's in like, I don't know, 700 and something record stores in the United States, all over Europe. You could pre-order the record by just going to kings uh, kingsneverdieofficial.com. If you go to our website, which we just literally redid, you literally just go to kingsneverdieofficial.com. You scroll down. You can see all the videos, everything. But you can pre-order the record from Cortex Worldwide, from Nuclear Blast Germany, from Cortex Germany, you, if you're in Australia, you can order it. If you're in Japan, you can order it. U.S., Merch Bar, Tower Records. Did you know that Tower Records is like way back into record distribution? Yeah, I've heard about this. You're not the first person yeah. that have brought this up. Yeah. Yeah, they took a shitload of records, man. Like yeah, Tower I, Records. There's a, whole new, there's a whole new world, man, with the vinyl. They said this is the first year in like 37 years where vinyl outsold everything. So it, it's in a comeback, and I think that's going to help them. And uh, obviously because of the, their entire model shifted so greatly when streaming, this is something that we had talked about with different guests on another podcast where the streaming digital stuff really fucked with the physical copies. And now mm-hmm. with the influence of the record store day and the, small labels to giant labels, making sure they have new records for that time. I think it's really uh, brought some cool shit back into the fun of collecting records. You know, like I loved, I love back in the day with the vinyl. I love the cassettes. I love the liner notes. I kind of get bummed out that most of the music that I listen to is a click of a button. You know, I miss the opening of the cellophane coming off. You know, yep. and, and now when I buy a record, like, you know, I got a sheer terror when they finally uh, put on vinyl, uh, just can't hate enough. I got yep. it, stuck it on the wall. I got a Coldest Life record on the wall back here because they're records I love, but I don't need to listen to because I have to click Spotify, you know. But I think yeah. physical copies are always going to add a, an extra level of immersion for the fan. I think that everything that you're doing is right. I, I, I support everything that you've done. I always continue to support you as a friend. And just because I know what you do in earnest is straight up from your heart, you know, like 
you have no reason to do this otherwise. And you still have a fucking crazy drive, especially after the neck surgery, all the stuff that we just talked about, man, your, your, your drive is commendable at the, at the lowest and outstanding man to see you still just want to play music, especially with all the laurels that you can stand on. is fucking fantastic. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, first of all, I, I fucking appreciate that. I can't explain how much, but like, I'm, I'm just not big on like resting on your laurels. Like you're only as good as what you, what, what you did yesterday and what you're going to do tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, um, you know, if, if you could rest on your laurels every time doggy dog played in the United States, that it'd be fucking off the, you know what I mean? Like I, and don't get me wrong. Like I love, I really enjoy and love the fact that I still get to play doggy dog shows. You know what I mean? Like I love those songs. I really do where, you know, mucky pup is something that I just can't relate to mentally anymore. The content. I can't relate. I'll tell you one thing I would love to do. I'd love to take old Mucky Pup songs and rewrite them more in today's mindset. You know what I mean? I think you could pull it off. Dude, I would. I, that's something I would love because I think there's a lot of great fucking material and like it could really be like updated, but that like, these are all like projects. Like I'd love to do in, in the future. You know what I'm saying? If people want them, like if there's a demand for them, Zach, whether it's Zach here, Thorne and, and Mike from bulldoze yeah. would go fucking crazy for it. Yeah. <laughs> a huge fan. Zach's, Zach's fucking the man, man. I love Zach. I was talking to Zach about doing, doing, uh, doing like this bulldogs fucking little side project. Dude, he Dude, I, he's so far. He's another so talented guitar player and writer and composer. Yeah. Yep, and he's a great fucking person, man. He's just a good guy, good husband, good fucking father. Like you know, when you find people that like you really respect, like it doesn't go away. You know what I mean? Like he's fucking good people, man. Uh, Ray, yeah, he's fucking- people like these i've known we've known each other for 30 fucking years you know 20 years 30 years however long it's been like you really create a mutual respect for each other you know what i mean and um you know these guys are guys i grew up going to shows with and moshing for their bands and Ray, yep. I play a lot of shows with these guys, man and just yeah i'm happy that that, that they're doing the bulldoze thing and they're get you know they're getting you know, they're getting on good shows and they're getting shine. Like, I think it's great, man. I think it's great for them. I'm happy for them. You know well, what well, I mean? I mean, it's just a hard, it's a hard thing for them because they've always wanted to do it. Dev one world eliminated some of the abilities for them to get to the point. And then here comes hardcore being obsessed with bulldoze. We get them back to be able to play. And then Kevin passes. And there was a minute where there was doubt. And I try to tell him like, the kids are still going to go off and, if you would have just seen them in FYA, man, they were elated. I man, saw the video. Oh, it was so fucking fantastic. And, and I saw them at the holiday jet. Like I stood right, like I watched it. You know what I mean? Like it's those fucking dudes could fucking play, man. I mean, even you know, Chris fucking did a great job behind the drums. Ray steps in, plays the bass. Fucking Zach, just a great fucking rhythm. He's just a good fucking guitar player, man. And and you know, it's 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 awesome to see. By the way, I know I told you already, but that fucking that Shattered Realm fucking set blew me out of the water. It's a surreal thing to hear from you, but I do uh, truly appreciate I, it. First of all, I, obviously, like the fucking band was incredible. Like it so tight, but it to, I look, I mean, I'm I'll be honest, like I, I don't really love I don't love everything I see. You know what I mean? But when I see something that I really like, I'm going to go tell somebody, hey, man, that was fucking great. And it's so fucking heavy and hard. Like, I just really enjoyed it. I thought it was fucking great. The crowd fucking went off. Like, it it just had energy. It was really, it was like a shining star of the night, I thought. I, I love doing the band. 
if I made it a focus of my life, I'd have a disorder. So I need balance. So when things get, yeah. when things get offered to us that make sense, we say yes, but I say no to a lot of things because disorder makes what I like to do less fun. So yeah, like, I got you. if that makes sense, like, because I'm committed other like other places with other stuff. Yep. If I if I started chasing down the shadow realm wormhole, it could throw things out of balance. And then and 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 I and I and I learn it about myself. So when we play, it's super this is super backwards. You'd have a better chance of Shadow Realm showing up and playing for free than offering us like three thousand dollars to play your town far away. Right. Because it would take us longer and take time away from other shit. It has to be done to do it. If that makes sense. And the things, and are, the things were like these special events make it special. Is the point? Yeah, I got hit up by the guys. Hey, do you want to do the coldest live show? Yeah. No. Yeah. So of no, course. No, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll do it. Yeah. But, <laughs> yo, listen. I don't. I don't need money to play that show. Like, I just want yeah. to be a part of it, and just being invited was awesome. Um, let's let's formally wrap this up by saying that. I think that you have a lot of energy, not only just for your age, but for all your time put into this music that you're still able to harness it. A lot of people, they, they pull away or they don't get to do the things they want to do. And the stuff that they put out, it, I think it's just because they're just trying to chase things that they didn't get. The stuff that you're putting out is raw. It's real. And, and I see when you're at the shows with us, you're still in the moment feeling it, you know, like, and, and that's really important. And I, and I find that as long as you keep doing this and as long as you keep pursuing this shit, the way that you push it and the way that you like, you are intently focused on it, things are going to, things are going to continue to move forward for you. And I see a lot of people that I know who do these things. And if the immediate accolades don't come, then they're on to the next thing. Like they're just chasing the attaboy. And I don't see that in you. I see there's like an, an inner inertia to drive and push this stuff. I think that if you continue to do this, whether it's one of these projects and just Kings never die in general, I think that you're going to play well into your homo 60, my friend, if not longer, because it seems like your drive isn't ending, man. And that says a lot because again, so many people rest on, do you know what band I played in? Or do you know what I did? You know, like, where yeah. is you like, fuck it. This is my new shit. This is what I'm driving. And it's a unique thing. You don't hear it too often because so many people are afraid of doing something new and not getting the same reaction from the project that's older. And that's, yeah. that's I mean, look, I have a lot of friends that are, are way older than me that are doing this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Uncle Vinny is much older than I am. And I got to tell you, man, he's got more energy than I do. He's like a fucking jackrabbit. You know what I'm saying? Like this, this music, Joe, has nothing to do with your age. And I'm also playing with guys that are much younger than me. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, me and Danny are well into it. But, like, we're, we're playing with guys that are younger. You know what I mean? Dylan Gordino is, like, to me, a guy that people have yet to kind of meet. You know what I'm saying? He's not a very outspoken, uh, uh, dominant personality. It, does that make sense? Yes. But the guy's got a lot to say, and he's a fucking good person, and he fucking gives every ounce of his being when he's on that stage and plays live. You know, he's not one of those guys that's going to, like, fucking, uh, you know, talk a bunch of bullshit that he really doesn't mean. And fuck, you know, like, he's just not, that's not his way. He fucking goes up there, and he fucking gives everything. And I love this fucking guy's voice, like, I think he's somebody that's kind of just coming into his own. And I'm excited to do this for a guy like him. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, you know, I didn't even know this until like maybe like a year or two ago, but like, and I, I, it's, it's kind of funny, but like Dylan, I saw it, like there was a video of like Dylan at his high school talent show playing It's Like That from Dog Eat Dog. What? Yeah. That's crazy. So it's like, 
like it. That's a full but circle moment. Is, huh? Like, imagine him like he's playing with his 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 favorite band, Biohazard, and he gets to you know play with Dan. Now look, Danny's got Biohazard commitments, so we're gonna have to we're gonna play shows in July without him, and that that's fine. Like that's what this band could do. That you know what I'm saying? Like we have the ability to do that. That is Danny's priority. And after he's done with his biohazard, like with the cycle of, you know, he's got to go to Europe the end of July into August, whatever other stuff they have planned. Like you, he's got four guys that are so happy for one. We're can't wait to see them play because we're fans Two, We're happy for all of them that they're getting to do it. You yeah, know what this I'm is saying? a this is a second shot in the arm for these guys, man. So hopefully they take advantage hope, of it. Yeah, and 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 if it fucking just goes off, and this is something that he's got to commit to for the next whatever, you know what, man? Like I'm grateful that we got to make this fucking gr- like great record together. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I get to play with, you know, Larry the like Larry the Hunter. And Larry's like the fucking coolest guy. Like, I I love this fucking guy. And Evan has like pumped a lot of energy into us because he's just a fucking cool, chill dude who just loves to play. He doesn't care about we're going to fucking go to Buffalo and play in front of only 60 people. Like, he can't wait to go do that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, he just loves to play and can't wait to play and that's the type of people that like i want to be surrounded with you know you take you said it before like it's gradual we take two steps forward i feel sometimes like we take one step back take two steps forward we take one step back so i'm willing i think we're all willing to just ride out the ride man um and i really think that when People get to hear, you know, the record gets released May 26th. And I would just ask people to please just go, just give the record a chance, give it a listen. And then you make your own assumptions or your own opinions on whether you like it or not. You never have to listen to it again. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I, and you got to be cool with that, man. No, I, I think the. Like I said, thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, the releasing of a record and hoping that it gets some people moving, but being fearless in that you love the, the process of making it. I, there are some shows we've played in the middle of nowhere that meant more and made lifelong lasting friendships with them versus yeah. shows we played in big places with hundreds. Sometimes I mean, we played Pressure Fest in Germany and the only friends I made were two people from England. I didn't know anybody there. We had our friends from the bands and it was like, all right, show's over. What else can we do? The small shows mean the world. And I just think grinding it out, putting your work. Sometimes festivals are like that though, Joe. Yeah, dude, I, I, I tell you this now, it's one of the reasons why I might not have been the best suited person to be in shadow realm because not only did I have a union job and I liked being home and booking shows and being a part of the Philadelphia hardcore scene, I also don't get that surge of excitement if the kids aren't almost hitting me in the face or singing the words wrong or pulling me in the crowd. Like my ADHD, I'm like, oh, what am, how am I supposed to climb down? Yeah. Like <laughs> it's too much for me. So I, I, I do enjoy, I do enjoy the opportunity to play in the smaller European stuff, but I, I can say, I think shadow realm is going to be doing stuff in 2024 in Europe. I got to get my brain wrapped around that. Uh, we're going to try and see uh, if we all at this current group enjoy it, what we do with it. But uh, what we're going to do with this is uh, we're going to make the most of the time that we have right now with everything going on in life. I think things I learned about the not only about the time of COVID, but also just the time. There's a lot of people that are, I mean, Eddie's sick. My mom's fighting cancer. There's always different people. I think people take no time anymore because everything is immediate. Everything like that text message you have to read, that email you get on your phone. There's never a time to sit back and go, what's really important? So creating shit and doing shit, sometimes 
I think it's it, we need to take time and understand the importance of just having the opportunity to do it. It's tons of people that don't get to do these kind of things, whether it's playing shows, whether it's just sitting in like, I actually stopped hating band practice. I actually like being there. I like doing the songs, which is for me, I was always like a task. I looked at it like reps you have to put out just to make sure you're still tight. I actually enjoy being around and hearing the songs. So I think you have you have the best embodiment of all this because you're like, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to put this out. I think more people need to take this time and go, holy shit, yeah, I don't have to worry about this. I just have to do it and see where it goes. A lot of people want to do something for the outcome, not for the sense of, hey, they did it. And I think that that's what makes you be able to do what you're doing, man. It's fucking fantastic. We'll make sure when the record is in hand that we also continue to push it on the podcast. I love playing songs by people who I know have put their whole ass into hardcore. There's a ton of people out there playing in hardcore bands now who may not be as invested, not just emotionally, but just time in. And I know everything you do, you put your heart into it. And that's why I was happy to have you come on the show. I was going to, um, I had written out a bunch of shit from back with a bong and stuff like that, that, that era. But the story that we just went over is so much fucking cooler than that, that I won't uh, bother you with like little trivial like things. But I think that you spoke from your heart here and your story is fucking fantastic. And I like that you're like, yeah, I could have did this, but I also got married and had a real life because sometimes the people yeah. that toured and did all those things, they didn't have the other half, man. Like you've been able to, what do you say? Like dip your feet in both the waters, you know, like, you know what it's like to tour the band, but you also know what it's like to be a man, have a wife, raise kids. Yeah. And, and that's equally important. And I think that's important for you. If you don't think about it to realize, like sometimes people go very hard into one direction and they're probably sitting there at home now being like, yeah, I was on that record, but they don't have a wife. They don't have kids. Yeah. And it's something, and you know, the other, the other thing though, Joe, is this like my wife, Yes, when we were starting a family and we, dude, I mean, we needed fucking money, man. Like, I, you know, I want to kids buy ain't cheap, man. And, and well, kids ain't cheap when they're adults. Kids are cheap when they're babies. I didn't realize that until I, my kids became adults because they're fucking, they cost more money now than they did then. But the reality is, my wife has been, a huge supporter when she knew that I was like chomping at the fucking bit. And like, I, I was, you know, like, you know, I dipped my toe in the water along the way. Like I did make, I guess what you want to kind of consider a solo record after doggy. Yeah. Dog. You had that, uh, Nastasi. Yeah. Na- well, nasty is what they, oh, okay. You know, that's what the label used to call me. So they were like, we call it nasty, but that was a, a massive mistake massive because they were like three weeks we must have the record you so i literally had a cup like it was a mistake that's when i should have formed a band where i could have kind of maybe controlled the schedule a little bit right but regardless uh me dave and sean uh did make uh an alboro kings record just for the fun of it like in 2000 and so along the way I have been kind of dipping my you know like I've been able to get my fix we did like some mucky pup tours we did a live at Mexicali CD thing we did that we went to Europe a couple times with mucky pup in like 2008 2010 you know what I'm saying and then I again 2000 what was it seven uh, 18 you know, started to do some stuff with Eddie. So, but my wife has been like, and my whole family have been super supportive. And at this point, now that my kids are adults, like, it's nice knowing that my family supports me as much as they do because they just know how much I love to do it. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know if I could be so driven and all in without the support that I get from them. Well, it's probably so, the, it's probably also the years you spend as a father and a husband supporting them. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably the boomerang effect of being like, I know how much my dad's heart is into this music or how much my, I mean, 
Yeah. That's, and that's the reciprocation that comes from being who you were for them. Yeah, it's crazy. And I've coached high school football the last 12 years. So you <laughs> fucking that is it. brother, you're like me, man. We're doing shit all night. I love it. <laughs> I left. Fo- I-, I left the football workout in the coaches meeting at seven o'clock, came back to my office at seven thirty. But like, Joe, like I'm like you, like. I got to keep fucking move. Like I like to stay busy. Yeah. I love the game of football. I love the strategy. I'm an offensive coach. You know what I mean? So I've been doing this 20 years. I've been coaching football, 12 years coaching high school football at a, at, you know, uh, I spent five years coaching at a school Bergen cat. Like, you know, I've been doing this like at a pretty, you know, like if I do anything, I want to do it all the way. And I've dedicated a lot of my life to that. I've dialed that back. I'm now coaching a high school freshman team because that allows me more time with my family and to work and be able to do the band. You know what I'm saying? Like it's give and take. It's give and take. But ultimately we got to do shit that we love to do. If you're not doing things you love to do, you're fucking wasting your life. Couldn't agree more. You can't fucking Netflix and chill every minute of your life. <laughs> no, not you at all. know, if you're getting stoned and playing video games all day, you're wasting your fucking life. Like, okay. But like, you can't, you know what I'm saying? Like, you only get one life, man. Live it. Yeah. I don't know. What, like, I don't, I don't, to me, it's like, of course, like, that's the way it is. You know, so, of course, when it comes to, you know, something that you think, hey, man, I'd love to do this. I fucking think I'm pretty good. You know, I, I'd like to think that I'm pretty good. You know, I, I hey, man, I got lucky a couple of like, couple times. I'm going to do it now because I just fucking love to do it. Man, I hope people dig it. If they don't, what am I going to do? Doesn't mean I'm not going to give 100 percent effort like I'm all in. You know, I'm fucking I mean, you know, yeah. I'm I'm sure it gets to Hey. Anything coming up? You got any fucking shit? Like anything we fit on? <laughs> yeah, but if you so didn't, but if you didn't, but if you didn't do that, sometimes I'm in the middle of something and I have a, oh yeah, you know what? We actually do have some shit, you know, yeah. like it's important. Now I think all, you know, I think all in is a way you got to go on these things. Um, Everything. You have, you have a shit ton of different projects that blow my mind that have succeeded. And I really do hope that you continue to push things never die. And now I got to bully Richie to start a band with you. And then somehow yeah, get, and somehow, in, and somehow get Zach Thorne involved too, because I think the three of you guys together would write some wild shit. I mean, I'll tell you what, I'll fucking play bass in that band. I'm, te- I'm literally going to text Richie and tell him Dan wants to do it a band. Yeah. He plays bass. You know, Richie, it's so funny because I, you know, I mean, I, I love, I think fucking Richie's fucking great guy. You know, and he's been trying to help me out. I've been trying to get like a lighter rig. He's trying to hook me up with this positive, you know, he lent me his positive grid amp, uh, you know, whatever. I try to help him out with some of like, you know, whatever screen printing stuff. Uh, But he sent me this piece of music, this little piece of music he was working on. And I was like, the second I heard it, I was like, oh, man, I got I got a lyrical idea for that. Like, just for fun, totally for fun, he had this little piece of music I took, and I took, like, his piece, and I, like, had a vocal idea, so I recorded this, I mean, shitty version on, like, GarageBand, but, like, that's the thing that people that love to create music and shit, that's, like, the fun, to me, that was, like, fun, it was, like, an afternoon, like, oh, man, I hear this thing, you know, I, I think... It was like the chains that won't let go or something. But that's the that's the thing that people that are driven to do. Like, that's the stuff that you do, like, just for fun is, like, work on a little piece of music. You know what I mean? Like, I would love to do more things writing with other people, uh, do a little project. Uh, I would love it if it was somebody else's music and I could just, like, have my little bit of input into it. You know what I mean? Like, it would be fun to not be massively involved, you know, put the finishing touches on something or just work with a bunch of people that, you know, love to do it. 
you know, and, and it's crazy. Zach's one of those guys. Richie loves to create. I love it. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we're making this happen. We're making the Zach, Dan, Richie yeah. thing happen. Yeah. And fun. you can fucking scream your fucking head off over it. I'm not talented enough. <laughs> you need some move with <laughs> Hey, listen, um, do the official at, 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 and help people how to get a hold of you and yep. anything, um, any else pertinent that we need to say so that way someone listens, they can look, and then we always tag everything at TIACpodcast.com as well. That would be awesome. But it's it's stupid simple. The record, the actual street date is May 26th, right? Yep. There's th- three videos out. You just go to YouTube. Make Them Anymore was the first video. You know, and like we're super stoked, man. It has almost like twenty thousand views in like four weeks. Like that's fucking for awesome. Us, that's like fucking killer, man. We're like freaking out. You know what I mean? And and it's a cool video. It's an in dirty club video. It's really well done by uh, Raise Fist Propaganda. And then the second video, Stay True, is on either Hardcore Worldwide or we have our own version. So there's two versions of that. That came out like two and a half weeks ago. Yeah, and I'm then, looking at it now as you're saying these. Yep. Yeah, I I don't even know. I don't even I, the views doesn't even matter. But if people want to check that out, you could also go to our website, which is where you could do everything. It's just kingsneverdieofficial.com. You could see the videos if you want to. And the big thing is, please like pre-order the vinyl. Uh, like, please don't wait for the vinyl to come out because so far, you know, we're super grateful. Like, it, it seems like the pre order is going, you know, pretty well, but like the vinyl is beautiful. The first pressing glow in the dark. Uh, you could just go to our website, kingsneverdieofficial.com. You could order. I always tell people to order from Cortex Records, but. If that's not convenient in the United States, Tower Records or Cortex, Merch Bar, um, in Europe, you can order from, they're all on our site, Nuclear Blast, Germany, Cortex, uh, there's a whole list, Uh, Japan, Australia, everything can be done on our website, and social media wise, it's the same thing. Kings never die official with all underscores. Kings underscore never underscore die underscore official. Uh, in, that's Instagram. Never go to Kings never die official with no underscores. That's fucking. I got scammed. <laughs> Suck. So fucking asshole, man. Fuck, that sucks. But, but it's, Live and learn. You know, King, Kings never die official with underscores. And Facebook is just Kings never die banned. Um, but, uh, you know, or I don't give a shit. Take it for fucking free. Like go to Spotify, you know, go to Apple music. The, the three singles are up on those avenues as singles until the record comes out. Then they'll be on the record. Um, go listen to old shit. If you want, fuck the old shit. Just listen to the new shit, like whatever you want, but you know, give it a listen. May 26th. Uh, and really, that's it. What else is there other than Instagram, Facebook? And nah, that's website? it. That's all you got. Yeah, man. Well, I hope you enjoyed that one. Dan Nassazi, again, New York hardcore and everywhere else thanks you for all the years that you put in. Had a, a fucking crazy run of bands. Few people do one cool band, and the, the shit that he did is absolutely fucking fantastic. And it's cool to see him doing Kings Never Die. Make sure you again check out kingsneverdieofficial.com. I'm going to have all the links. Just want to say it one more time. A little wiped out. Had a rough little concrete pour. Got a little hot. A little bit a little bit um, sunburnt. But hey, fuck it. We're still rolling. There's a slew of new episodes in the box already recorded. Like as I'm doing the intro, outro, and all the shit for this one, I've got three more already that also get intros and outros trying to stay ahead of this crazy workload that's going on and so if i'm a little bit off the cuff so to speak on these intros and outros it's because i'm doing this shit at nighttime 
trying to make it happen before I got to go rushing and go back to work the next day. Thank you for always supporting This Is Hardcore Podcast. Um, I'm getting caught up on some of the video stuff to get the Andy King episode out. And I just appreciate you listening to the podcast. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for the critiques. And if you want to go ahead and actually get on the show, be a part of the show, be a guest, you got something you want to say, um, hit me up directly on social medias and I'll put you in touch with Jess who schedules the podcast. Because that's the only way it gets fucking scheduled. If you email with her. Because I'm way too fucking busy. And if you ask me what I'm doing three weeks ago, I don't fucking know. So that's so why I got someone to schedule the show. Um, also, if you got tracks you want us to put out on the beginning of the show, send them fucking, you know. Don't send me no dot .AMR like that fucking Carter. Motherfucker sent 78 fucking tracks and always sends them in that way. Motherfucker. Um... Support real ass hardcore. There's going to be a fucking fantastic summer. And you have no excuse with all the bands that are active and whooping ass to not be a part of today's hardcore scene, which I think is a great blend of support for real and pure hardcore with all the nasty drama bullshit completely removed from the late 90s and early 2000s scenes. I think this is a real high tide for hardcore. And I'm excited to see what comes out. Of the next couple months. I can't wait for This Is Hardcore. Can't wait for Bob to drop the fucking FYA lineup. Can't wait to fucking play the Cold Is Life reunion show. A lot of exciting shit for me. Hope there's exciting shit for you in hardcore. And I'll talk to you next week. Goodbye.